These words were just quickened to my heart three days ago, and I just want to pass it on to you. Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2, we're going to read verses 7 through 9. Psalm chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. You know, many times in the Bible, especially in Psalms, there are two people talking. One, the psalmist himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is writing, is saying something. But he's actually expressing the words of who someone else speaking. Sometimes it's the Messiah, the Lord speaking. And here's one of those examples where the psalmist is writing something, but it's also the words of the Messiah making uh, saying these same words. So let's read that. Psalm 2. He says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So here's the word of the Lord, the promise of the Lord being given to the son. And he's saying, you know, you ask, I've begotten you, ask of me, I'll give you nations, and I'll give you the ability to rule, conquer, and so on. But I want to look at the first part of verse 7, where he says, I will declare. I will declare. I'm going to declare something. I'm going to say something. I'm going to make a proclamation. I will declare. What? The decree which the Lord has said to me. So there is a decree. When the king speaks, it's a decree. When the king of kings speaks, it's an absolute decree. He has declared something. Which he has said to me. And what will I do? I will declare it. I will declare the decree which the Lord has said to me. I will declare it. The Lord speaks to us several ways. One, of course, this is God's decree, what God has spoken to us, the written word of God. It's available for all of us. All the promises here is God's decree which He has spoken to every child of God, every believer. It's yours. What does the psalmist say? I will declare the decree which the Lord has said to me. So declare, declare, speak, proclaim what God has said to you. Take this word. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not be in want. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. The Lord is my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The Lord is my healer. He forgives all my sins. He heals all my diseases. By His stripes, I am healed. I will declare the decree. You know, they say silence is golden. But sometimes silence is not golden. You need to speak. Amen? Amen? You need to declare. And I felt, you know, the Lord just waking me up to this truth. I mean, we've talked about it so many times. But I you know, kind of just kind of slacken a little bit. So God just waking me up. Come on, you need to make your declaration of faith. You need to declare the decree. Of what the Lord's spoken to you. Secondly, there are things God speaks to you by His Spirit. To you, personally. So this, the Lord's speaking to the Son. Obviously, through the Son, it's for the church. But there are things God speaks to you in your spirit, saying, this is what I'm about to do in your life. So declare it, declare it, declare it, say it. I will declare the decree which the Lord has said to me. So in your spirit, God speaks certain things. You need to declare it. When you make your declaration, chains are broken. When you make your declaration, the storms and the winds calm down. When you make your declaration, things around you begin to sh are shaped and formed. When you make your declaration, angels go into assignment, go into action. Amen? So, 
Let's say this together. I will declare the decree which the Lord speaks to me. Amen. Don't keep quiet. Declare it. Let's stand up to our feet. Make a declaration this morning. I want you to hold your Bible high up in the air. Say this out loud and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His words. I believe His words. And I live by His words. Christ is my master, and to him I am an absolute surrender in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated, please. We're continuing this morning just to brood and think about the subject of the glory of God. And this morning, I want to just talk to us. A little bit more on manifesting the glory of God. On manifesting the glory of God. Just take us a little bit further in that. You know, last Sunday we looked at Isaiah 60, verses 1, 2, and 3, where God says, My glory shall be seen upon you. God wants His glory to be seen through His people. He wants His glory to be seen through you. And when we use the word glory, in the Bible the word glory is used in many different contexts. But when you look at the Hebrew word kabod, when you look at the Greek word doxa, and you just look at them and study them, in the context in which we are talking about, the word glory means a manifestation, an expression of who God is, And what he does. His splendor put on display. So people can see it. And God says, my glory will be seen upon you. Who I am, what I do, will be seen through you. Amen. Now, how many of you believe in the cross of Jesus? Yes, You believe, do you believe that Jesus came to completely, totally set us free from sin and its results? Do you believe it? Yes or no? I mean like fully, not partly. You believe that? Then you need to believe. That if Jesus Christ died to completely set us us free completely from the power of sin and and take care of it completely, then you need to believe that you can be a person who will manifest the glory of God. Because what does sin do? For all have sinned and fall short of the... If sin deprives us of living a life in the glory of God. And if Jesus Christ on the cross dealt with sin and all its consequences, then it means that every person who passes through the cross is now able to live in the glory of God. Amen. Because sin keeps us from living in the glory of God, living in the manifestation of of God's glory. There are several things I just want to impress on our hearts this morning. The first is this, that you and I were designed to manifest His glory. Amen? We were designed by God to manifest His glory, to reveal who He is and what He does here on earth. God designed us that way. 
So living a life that manifests glory is the normal life. Amen? Some of us believe in the cross enough to receive forgiveness for our sins, but not enough to say, God, I've got to live a life that manifests the glory. We believe in 50% cross. Enough for my sins to be forgiven. But don't tell me I have to live in the glory. Well, if sin robbed you and me of a life that manifests the glory of God, and if Jesus Christ came to deal with sin, and if you and I affirm that he dealt with sin, then we also got to affirm that we can live a life that truly manifests the glory of God. Amen? It's getting too heavy here. You can following me? You and I were designed by God to manifest His glory. Sin deprived us of that. Sin makes us fall short of that life where God is revealed through us, who He is and what He does. But Jesus dealt with it on the cross. So the first thing I want to impress really on, on our hearts is, I was designed, you were designed, to put God on display. To manifest His glory, who He is and His attributes, His character. To put God on display, manifest who He is and what He does. We want to go to a controversial passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But I want to focus not on the controversy, but on one important truth that Paul mentions here as he addresses a difficult topic. Now Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he deals with a lot of local church issues. So these are issues very specific to the Corinthian church. They are not issues with a global body of Christ that Paul is, uh, many issues that Paul addresses in his letter to the Corinthians. And one of that has to deal with the covering of the heads. That's what Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 16. He's dealing with an issue here of whether women should cover their head or not. Now, it's a very specific, cultural, context-based issue in the Corinthian church. And uh, what actually is going on there in the Corinthian church is that in Corinth, the prostitutes shaved their heads. Now, many of them believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, came into the local church. So now we have this Corinthian church that has, you know, has believers from all kinds of backgrounds. Some of them were prostitutes in the former life. Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians 6, as such were some of you, but now you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord. And so in that context, women with long hair, women who were married, covered their head as a symbol, as a sign that they belonged to a husband. Whereas prostitutes didn't. Their head was sewn. So now you get, got all of them sitting in the church. And in that context, Paul says, okay, women, it's, it's an honor for you to have hair on your heads. And as a symbol that you're married, you cover your so that's the word he gives to the Corinthian church. But how does he conclude that? If you go down to verse 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 16, he says, But if anyone seems to be contentious, meaning if you want to argue about this, if you want to debate about this, whether women should cover their head or not, here's Paul's response. He says, we have no such custom. Neither do the churches of God. They say, look, this is a very particular issue for you Corinthians. But if you want to talk about it, debate about it, forget it. I'm not interested because I, and in our ministry now, what we do, the kingdom of God, there is no such custom. Other churches don't have it. So here's a very simple answer. If somebody tells you, why don't you cover your head in church? Just tell them, I don't go to the Corinthian church. Very simple. I go to all people's church or whatever church. <laughs> all 
All right, so that's just a little side issue. But what I want to point out to you in this whole discussion, as he's addressing this, about whether you should cover your head or not, he deals, he brings out some uh, insight, revelation, in, important truths concerning the being in the image of, of, of being created in another's image. So we'll read, read some of those verses. Verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created from woman, but woman for the man. Now skip to verse 11. Nevertheless, aside from what I've already said, nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through the woman, but all things are from God. So, I don't want us to get into this controversy of is man better than woman, because Paul, he says, even though man came first and woman from the man, he says, in the Lord, we're all equal. Neither is the man independent of the woman, neither is the woman independent of the man, but we are all one in Christ Jesus, all right? So, there is no superiority of gender here. That's not the issue, and that's not what I want to dwell about. What I want to focus on is what he says about being made in the image of God in verse 7. He says, for man was in the image and glory of God. The reason we were created in the image and likeness of God was to be, give us the capacity to manifest the glory of You were designed. You were designed to manifest the glory of God. To put God on display. You were designed in the image and likeness of God. So that through you, who He is and what He does can be manifested here on earth. Amen? You look in the garden in Genesis chapter 1. And the Bible says, God says, let us make man in our own image. Verse 27 says, so he created man in his own image, male and female, he created them. And he said to them, fill the earth, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion. So when it says he created man, male and female, it's talking about mankind, male and female. Both created in the image and likeness of God. Both created with a capacity to manifest the glory of God. Amen? So you were designed to show forth God's glory here on earth. I want to just spend a little time about this garden, about life in the garden, just to highlight something. Then we'll come back talking about manifesting the glory of God. You know, when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, he told them, I want you to tend the garden, and I want you to guard the garden. Didn't he say that? Implying that outside the garden was something, somebody, would want to intrude and destroy what God had given Adam in the garden. So guard the garden. Are you all with me so far? Tend the garden and guard it. Because there's somebody outside the garden who wants to come in and you've got to guard the garden. But he also gave Adam and Eve this, this word. He said, I want you to fill the earth. I want you to subdue. Why would you subdue something if it was not first in rebellion? So when God gave Adam the command to subdue, to bring under control, under rulership, I believe God was saying, in this garden, I want you to take what you have in this garden, replicate it and fill the earth with it. 
But in the process, you've got to guard it. Don't let it be disturbed. And in the process, you also got to subdue what's outside the garden. The devil was there. Are you with me so far? So he said, Adam, I want you to fill the earth. Subdue it. And I am giving you dominion. Authority flows from me through you, empowering you to guard the garden and subdue the earth. Fill the earth and subdue it. Take, it's almost like God saying, what I'm giving you in the garden is a prototype. I want you to protect it, but I want you to fill the earth with what you've got in the garden. Amen? That's why later on the prophet came and said, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the... That was God's intent. For the earth to be filled with the glory of the Lord, with expressions of who God is and what He does. He wants the whole world to be, earth to be filled with that. It began in the Garden of Eden saying, this is a prototype. Adam and Eve, you preserve what I'm giving you in the garden. I'm giving you dominion to guard it and Fill the earth with it. Subdue everything else around the earth that would oppose this kind of, of, of an environment from coming. I'm giving you the dominion to do it. You are created in my image. You are created in my likeness. You carry my glory. I want to see the earth filled with the glory of the Lord. Go do it. Amen? Now, when you think about guarding the garden, subduing, having dominion, these are military terms, but God never gave Adam any ammunition. No weapons of warfare to guard the garden, to subdue what's outside the garden. No weapons. But Adam and Eve were fully able to guard the garden, to subdue the earth, to fill the earth with the glory of the Lord, to have dominion. They're fully able. So what weapons did Adam and Eve have in the garden? What did they have? They were created in the image and likeness of God. They carried the glory of God. Who they were and what they had. What did they have? The most important thing, and I can, I can think of maybe four things. One, they had a relationship, a very intimate relationship with God in the garden. Didn't they? Which no other created being had with God. Adam and Eve had. So intimate, so close with the Father, with God, that the Bible says that God would walk in the cool of the garden and say, Hi, Adam, how's the day going? And that was the kind of relationship they had. That's the first thing. The fact that he was created in the image and likeness of God, he carried the glory of God. And he had this relationship with God. What else did Adam have? He had a life that was solely submitted to God. Submission. So what do you mean? God told Adam, don't eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam said, yes, sir. No questions asked. You know, God, why that one tree? God, can I at least touch it? Can I go near it? Can I smell it? I'll taste just a little bit. I won't eat the whole fruits. Nothing. His life was in total submission to God. Our authority on earth is in direct proportion to our submission to God. What else did Adam have? He had responsibility. He had an assignment. God gave him a mandate. I want you to fill the earth, subdue it. Tend the garden, keep it. I'm putting you to work. Go do your work. Just stay doing it. You have an assignment, do it. He had an assignment. A responsibility. And what else did Adam add? He had a dominion just flowed through that relationship with God. Amen. And the fact of who Adam was and what he had was more than enough to guard the garden from Satan 
and to subdue and dominate the whole earth. That was enough. So what, I, what, what is the point I want us to get here? Every weapon of warfare that we talk about today, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the word of God, all these weapons came after the facts. The greatest weapon of warfare that you have is your relationship with God. That's it. That's all that Adam has. I'm a relationship with God. I'm a man created in his image and likeness. I walk in the glory of God. I walk in communion with God. I walk in submission to God. I walk in the assignment God has given. That is my greatest weapon. If I walk in it, I can guard everything God has given me. And I can subdue. I can fill. I can expand. That's all that Adam has. Amen? That's your greatest weapon of spiritual warfare. To the degree he has dominion in you, to that degree he will have dominion through you. To the degree he rules in you, to that degree he will rule through you. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil. He will flee from you. Amen? Then you say, but what about the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the word of God, and all these weapons of spiritual warfare? They are very valid. But they came after the fact. And they, they are tools that we use. But their strength is, first of all, rooted in your relationship with God. If that's not intact, you can repeat the name of Jesus a million times and the devil won't flee. Amen? Because your greatest weapon in spiritual warfare, to guard your garden and to take what God gave in the garden and fill the earth with it, is your relationship with God. Walking in submission to God. Walking in your assignment. Out of that flows his dominion. To fill, subdue the earth. Amen? So now let's go back to that thought that you were designed to really manifest the glory of God. You were designed to manifest his glory. To put God on display. So Adam and Eve sinned, and the sin disrupted this. We fell short of the glory. We fell short of living this kind of life that, that was to manifest the glory of God. But then Jesus Christ came into this world. John chapter 1, when we go to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by Him. In him was life, the life was the light of man. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So now Jesus walked in this glory. Now, we must understand that Jesus, when he walked on the earth, he walked as a man. He did not walk in his eternal glory. He walked in what we can call a sonship glory. Right? Because in John chapter 17, when he prayed his prayer, the high priestly prayer, as people call it, he spoke to the Father in John chapter 17. And he said, Verse 5, he said, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. John 17, 5. He's saying, Father, I want this glory which I had with you before the world was. That is his eternal glory, his glorious deity, which he did not have here on earth. So he's praying and asking for that. He says, Father, glorify me with this glory which I had with you before the world was. 
But he had a glory that he walked on the earth. In John 1, 14, we beheld his glory. So he walked in the glory. In John 1, 14. But not the glory that he had with the Father before he came to the earth. So that's eternal glory which he had with the Father. But the glory with which he walked on the earth is what we can call a sonship glory. And why is that important? Because in John 17 and in verse 22, he releases that same glory to you and me. In John 17 and verse 22, he says, And the glory which you have given me, I have given them. So this sonship glory that he walked in as a man, he says, I am releasing that to my people, to my people, those who believe in me. The glory which you have given me, I am giving them. This capacity to manifest who God is and what he does, I am giving to all my believers. Are you still with me? This is what we call, we can call as a sonship glory. It's not the eternal glory that made him deity. But it's the glory with which he walked on the earth as a man. And he said, the glory which you've given me, I've given them that they may be one as we are one. So this sonship glory he has released to every child of his, every believer in him. What I want us to understand, that though sin came into the world and disrupted the life in the garden... Jesus Christ came and restored it back for you and me. Amen? So that when we became new creation in Christ Jesus, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 23 tells us, Ephesians 4 and verse 23 says, Put on the new man. Verse 24, sorry. Ephesians 4, verse 24. Put on the new man. This is the new creation man, the new creation person that you became in Christ. Put on the new man, which is created in the image of God. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? It means it gives you the capacity to carry the glory of God. Put on the new man, which is created in the image of God, in righteousness and true holiness. So in your spirit, as a new creation being, you are now in the image of God. You have the capacity to put, to carry the glory of God, this sonship glory that Jesus gave you. He said, the glory which you've given me, I have given them. Are you with me so far? So this new creation being that you are in your spirit, has the capacity, is actually carrying the glory of God, the sonship glory. The capacity to make God known who He is and what He does is inside you. Don't struggle for it. It's in you. That's what you became when you were born again, when you were born from above. When you were born from heaven, when you were born again, inside you, you became a new man, created in the image of God, with the, with the glory, the sonship glory imparted into your being. Within you is the capacity to reveal who God is and what He does. It's there. Now, putting God on display fully, we're not there. We're progressing. We're going from glory to glory to really make him known because our mind and our flesh hinder the display of God's greatness. But what I want you to know is that you have been designed to manifest his glory. Everyone, every child of God, the littlest child of God, you've been designed to manifest who God is and what he does. You've been designed to do that. Amen. If you want, we, we could go to 1 Corinthians 15. Again, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is talking about resurrection, bodily resurrection. 
And it seems like when Paul is talking on one subject, he gives you insight into a totally different realm. And he does that again here in 1 Corinthians 15. I want us to look at verses 45 to 49 and just understand what he's saying. I am very clear of the context. He's talking about bodily resurrection. But I want us to see the truth that comes through as he's talking about that. In verse 45 to 49 of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving, a quickening, a resurrecting spirit. First man, Adam, was a life living being. But the second Adam, Jesus Christ, was a quickening, a resurrection power, a life-giving spirit. And he continues, However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. As is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. Notice what he says. As was the man of dust, so are those who are born of dust. We are like Adam in the natural but notice what he says, as was the heavenly man, so also are those who are, who are from heaven. Are you from heaven? You've been born again, born from above. So what he's saying, all of us who have been born from heaven, born from above, we are like the heavenly man. Verse, next verse. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. In our spirit, today, we carry the image of the heavenly man, of Jesus Christ. We're created in his image. Now one day, even our bodies will be changed. Even our mind and body will line up to that. We will know as he knows, and our bodies will also line up to that. But today, in our spirit, we bear the image of the heavenly man. We're born from above. Amen. Now, what does this life that manifests the glory of God, what does it look like? And how do we walk in it? Jesus Christ, the life that Jesus lived on the earth, is the perfect example of a life that manifests the glory of God. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The life that Jesus lived is the perfect example of the life that manifests the glory of God. And all of us as believers are called to live like Jesus. Aren't we? First John 2 verse 6 says, If anyone says he abides in him, he ought to walk even as he walks. We are to walk as he walks. The standard for Christian life is not the standard set by your church. Amen? Amen? The standard for Christian life is not the standard set by a discipleship manual. As good as the manual might be. The standard for Christian life is Christ himself. Amen? Be called to be like him. Walk as he walks. So if sin did not deprive us of living in the glory of God, then we would live as Christ lived. And that is what God is calling us to do. Now, don't get disappointed saying, oh, I'm not like Jesus. The purpose of today's message is to provoke us to move from glory to glory. Don't be satisfied. Oh, I've journeyed with God. 50% I've come so far. 50% is not good enough. Let's move. Till we all be like Jesus. Amen. Inside you, you got to be burning saying, Jesus, I want to live a life like you lived. I want to walk as you walked. 
that's what the Bible calls me to. And you've given me the capacity to do it. So I cannot make an excuse saying, oh, I can't be like him. No, 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 no. In the inside you, in your inner man, it's been created in the image of God, in the image of the heavenly man. You have been given the very sonship glory with which Jesus walked on the earth. So you and I have the capacity to walk as he walked. We must continue in our journey. Amen? So what would this life be like? If we all lived in the glory, what was this life that manifests the glory of God? If sin had not come and we didn't fall short of the glory of God, what would it be like? It would be like the life that Jesus lived. How was the glory of God manifested? We beheld His glory, John 1.14. We beheld His glory full of grace and truth. What manifests the glory of God? Grace. Grace. Used again in the Bible, very different context, but grace, virtue, character, full of grace. So when we walk in godliness, in the very virtue and character of our God, we are manifesting the sonship glory that we carry inside us. Are you with me so far? We beheld His glory. How? Full of grace. Full of virtue. We could see something of highest character in this person. Full of grace. And truth. Integrity. Purity. Light. Holiness. Full of grace. Full of truth. How do we manifest the glory? When we walk in grace. When we walk in truth. But it doesn't stop there. John chapter 2 verse 11. It says, this beginning of miracles... Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. How did he manifest his glory? Through miracles. Through the supernatural. Through doing things that was beyond the scope of human ability. He manifested his glory. Now all of us have been given that same glory. To manifest, which means all of us by default are miracle workers. Amen? It's not original. It comes from His glory. But miracles take place through you. Amen? It's His glory flowing through. His glory being manifested. How? Through miracles. This beginning of miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested His glory. He put God's glory on display. Through miracles. So grace, truth, miracles display the glory of that we carry. Amen? Now there used to be a time when there was this little kind of debate going on, especially in charismatic circles, you know. They had this little thing about, was Jesus prosperous or not? And, you know, I believe in God prospering us. I believe in God blessing His people and all that. But sometimes these little arguments that we get into seems so amusing and becomes a big issue in the body of Christ. So people would say, you know, Jesus was very prosperous. Why? Because he had his own house in Capernaum. And, uh, you know, because he traveled all the way by flight. He didn't take the bus or the train. So what do you mean? Because donkeys were supposed to be the best mode of communication. I don't know. I wasn't there. I didn't see his house. And I don't know if donkeys were the best mode of communication, whatever. But, you know, you have these little things going on. And um, 
in, especially in charismatic circles, oh, Jesus was very prosperous. He had his own house. He traveled by donkey and all that stuff. Oh, okay. All right. To me, that really doesn't matter. What I do see in Jesus is that he had the capacity to meet every need that he faced. I'm not saying he met everybody's need. But every need he faced, he had the capacity to meet it. Because he walked in the glory of God. When he was at a wedding and they said, there is no wine, they run out of wine. He said, go turn the water to wine. When they said, you've got to pay your taxes. Okay, I'll pay my taxes. Just, I'll do it a little differently. Peter, can you go catch a fish? Take the coin. Pay the taxes. I'll still pay. Just a different way when we operate in the glory. Jesus, there are 5,000 people and we need to feed them. Sure, I feed them. Give me what you have. Five loaves, two fish, bless. Fed 5,000 people and more. So to me, it is of little concern if he was very prosperous. Because even if he was very prosperous, I don't know if he would have fed 5,000 people. That's a little concern. The fact is, he demonstrated to us what life in the glory would be. He demonstrated to us what it would be if we were living not in sin, but in the glory, manifesting the glory. And in that kind of a life, whatever you need, you face. Whatever need you face, you have the God-given capacity to meet it. And that's a good life to live. Amen. How was the glory of God manifested? Full of grace. Full of truth. The miracles of God. The capacity to meet every need that you face. Not necessarily by natural means, but because you're living, manifesting the glory of God that's given to you. Amen. Amen. I want to close with one verse in the book of Zechariah. Because I realize many of us sitting here this morning, you know, I don't know how much this interests you. Talking about the glory of God, manifesting glory of God. Because you're probably sitting here this morning thinking of your meeting with boss, the boss tomorrow. You're thinking about all that you have to do tomorrow when you get to work. You say, Pastor, this is a nice sermon on a Sunday morning in church. So let's go to the book of Zechariah, chapter 1. But tomorrow morning, I've got a board meeting. Tomorrow morning, I've got to meet with you know, all these people. There's high demands, high pressure. And how does all this fit in to what I face Monday to Friday, for some of us, Monday to Saturday? I want each one of you to know that God has a unique assignment for your life. All of you who are in the marketplace. In Zechariah chapter 1, we see a very, very interesting thing happening. We'll read from verse 16. I'll close with this. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I'm returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts. And a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Again proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities shall again be again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. Verse 18. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. And I said to the angel who, talk, who talked with me, what are these? So he, so he said to me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah Israel and Jerusalem. Then, verse 20, then the Lord showed me four, what's the next word? Craftsmen. I mean, if he was in writing in our days, he might say like this, you know, then the Lord showed me four software professionals. Or it might read like this, then the Lord showed me four scientists. 
Then the Lord showed me four teachers. Then the Lord showed me four politicians. Whatever. The Lord showed me four craftsmen, people of the workplace, artisans, smiths. And I said, what are these doing? What are these going? What are these coming to do? I mean, God, IT professionals, what are, you, what are these coming to do here? So he, the Lord said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head. But the craftsmen, everybody say craftsmen. These IT professionals, these doctors, these people in the marketplace, these craftsmen are coming to terrify them, the horns, to cast up the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. Just to give you a little bit of background here, what's happening? God's people, Judah, Jerusalem, Israel, have been destroyed by four horns representing kingdoms or powers of this world. They come and destroy it. Now God says, I'm coming back to rebuild this, my people. I'm coming back to rebuild Jerusalem. I'm coming to reestablish my people. And a part of this restoration move of God for his people, for Zion, for Jerusalem, for Israel, God is saying, I will raise up four craftsmen. There are four powers of the world that have destroyed my people, but I will raise four craftsmen, men of trade, men from the market, people from the marketplace. They will come. They will push back these powers of the world. They will terrify. They will overthrow and cause my restoration to come for my Now apply that to the church. That is in rel relation to the land of Israel. People, we said in the last several times, what we say, what God declares for the people, he, we apply to the church. God is restoring the church. Bringing it back to a place of glory. You look at church history. For 1,000 years, we were so deprived in ruins. But God began a process of reformation and restoration for the body of Christ and he's brought us here but the work is not done he's coming back for a church that is fully strong that's like its master that's in the fullness of Christ the full measure of the stature of Christ he's coming back for a church that has no spot or wrinkle perfect manifesting God when you go to work tomorrow go to school or college you're one of those four craftsmen that God has raised up. You're part of that company of people whom God is using to cause the powers of darkness to push back so that he can restore his people, cause them to walk in the glory of God as he intended for them. Let's stand. Let's call our worship team up, please. Now, I want you to believe that God will use you, work through you, the glory of God inside you will be manifested through you. Expect, expectation is so important. There is no situation beyond what God can do. Expect the glory of God. It's not about your outer man. It's who you are on the inside. What God has done for you in Christ Jesus. That's important. Amen. Expect God to work through you. Expect God to release His glory through you. To manifest who He is and what He does through you. Will you take some time to pray right now, please? And just say, God, I believe I've been designed for this. I've been designed to manifest the glory of God. I've been designed 
to put God on display. His works, his power, his attributes, his character, his nature. To put God on display. Would you just pray and say, God, tomorrow, this week, as I go about doing what I'm, whatever I need to do, I really want to manifest your glory. Who you are, what you do. The grace and truth and wisdom. The power of God. Is rising up to every occasion. Meeting those needs. Father, we just pray that we will be a people who will truly manifest the glory of God, the glory of the Lord in the earth. To take what you've given us in the garden, Lord, so to speak, and to fill the earth with it. Just from the fact of who you've made us to be and the relationship we have with you. Let each one manifest your glory, God. Let each one manifest your glory. Father, we just thank you for this time together in your presence. We bless you, God. And I just pronounce your word upon your people, declaring arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Though darkness cover the earth and deep darkness the people, yet the Lord shall arise upon you. And His glory will be seen upon you. In Jesus' name. Amen.